Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Kamal Bolden, and I am an actor in the National Black Theater's production of Hands Up. And I am privileged to be joined right now with the inimitable Dennis <laughs> Allen III. Dennis A. Allen III, I'm sorry. Second. Oh, the second? Yeah. And I'm already speaking into existence. Yeah, yeah. So that, that would be speaking, yeah, the yeah. second. And um, he is the author of the piece, How I Feel. Um, thank you for joining. I appreciate that. Uh, what's going on? Come on, man. Good to see you, brother. Hey, it's good to be seen and not viewed, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, you're looking good, man. Hey, you too. You too. I like that shirt. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I want to get into the piece, man, um, How I Feel, yeah. uh, which is a part of this uh, this amazing production at uh, National Black Theater. Um, I'm going to just start off simply by asking you, Dennis, what inspired you to write How I Feel? Whew, man. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, of course, Keith Joseph Atkins and New Black Fest uh, reached out to a bunch of myself and uh, the other writers and gave us the challenge um, to reflect on the times, um, you know, specifically around Mike Brown and the Ferguson, Ferguson uprising. Um, and, you know, to say that it was daunting um, in terms of trying to process what my feelings around everything going on at the time would to be would be an understatement, you know. And uh, so the first piece, real talk, first piece I wrote was terrible. Um, it was horrible. I mean, it was it was all over the place. I actually did a little research before our conversation because I was like, I remember it being bad, but I don't remember exactly what it was because it's been so long. So I went back to see that first draft um, and it was it was it was bad um, and it was bad because I just it just wasn't focused, you know. Um, and as a writer, as my process, I usually send my work out to one or two people just to get a gauge on um what they're taking away from it and what they see. Um, and particularly my friend, Christopher Burris, who is also a director, um, who's directed a, a bunch of my pieces in the past. So I know he knows my work, he knows my heart, he knows what I'm trying to say, even when it's not coming across on the page. Um, and so I sent it to him and he was just like, he was silent for a second. And I was like, that that uncomfortable, insecure silence. <laughs> and I was like, hello? hello? <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you got that out the way. <laughs> I was like, okay. Uh -huh. Um, and and the thing was, what's interesting is was his suggestion was, um, among others, but this thing that stuck out for me was his suggestion was you need to go off in a corner by yourself, in a corner by yourself, away from uh your girlfriend at the time, uh Celestine, who is now my wife, um, and your mother, and you know, just be in yourself and see what you want to say. And interestingly enough, when I dove back into writing the second draft, that idea of going away from my girlfriend and my mother, actually, I did the opposite. And I leaned into what their experience was living and loving a black man. Yeah. Um, so that was the first part that I that, that started. And then I, I thought about the conversation that I had with my mother um, about her not wanting a boy uh, when she was pregnant with me. Um, and all the feelings surrounding that. Um, and as I started thinking about the feelings surrounding that and everything happening in the in the moment, and I was just like, well, how do I feel? Like, how do I feel right now? Mm -hmm. What what are, what are my feelings? Like, I haven't really checked in with myself, right? Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting, Dennis, because one of the questions that I had, a, I, I, I wanted to, I was really excited about asking, hmm. especially since I'm an actor in the piece, is was there an alternate version of this piece that you had, mm -hmm. meaning a previous draft of some sort, and what happened. So you kind of already, I mean, that's how we connected right there. You already yeah. got into it. But what's really interesting about that is this piece, obviously, is in response to Black men's, um, I wouldn't say involvement, but their harassment and, and oppression of uh, by the hands of white police officers in a, in, a, in a racist, systemically racist system, right? right? And someone asked you to go write how you felt or write a piece. And it's interesting, you found how you felt by going through the, 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 the view of black women in your life. When you were by yourself, I'm wondering what that was that didn't 
resonate yeah. with your friend and didn't resonate with you. Right. What was that when you were by yourself and you weren't, you know, thinking of through their view? Yeah, it's interesting. I think, I mean, you know, there are many things that have come up for me when you ask that question, brother. I think um, just when it comes to black man's emotionality um, and even being asked, how do you feel genuinely? I don't think I don't think that really happens. Um, and especially as black men, uh, we're told how I, how we feel is is secondary to getting shit done. Right. right. Um, or providing or being a protector. Right. And so the being the protector part, um, I know how to be that. Right. I know how to protect others. Um, but the idea of protecting myself or the idea of protecting myself emotionally is a foreign thing. Yeah. Um, and so it's interesting that I had to go through the black women in my life because they are coming from an emotional standpoint to get to my emotionality in terms of how I felt. Um, and so I had to end around myself <laughs> because, mm -hmm. um, you know, my conditioning of being a black man in America stopped me from even really confronting really the fear um, and the pain and the hurt uh, that I think we feel um, if you're, you know, relatively conscious as James Baldwin says, um, you're, you know, you're in rage at all times, right? Yeah. Um, and so tapping into that humanity in myself was difficult. So I had to use black women in a way, which is interesting and probably another conversation to have, um, to be able to tap into my own humanity. Let me ask you this. So you're an accomplished and, and, and one of my favorite writers. Oh. So this is something that you've already, yeah, I've already, you know, when I came to your show at uh, Brooklyn College, you know, I, mean, I was like, oh, my man, this is this for real. Oh, I hate that, man. So being that you're already a great writer and putting, juxtaposing that with, like you said, it's hard for black men or it's foreign for black men to even be asked how they feel. Mm -hmm. Is that how you got into writing? I know this is kind of a little bit off topic, but I'm so interested. It wasn't uh -huh. that as a black man, you're not able to share your emotions and stuff because I'm trying to figure out if other viewers might, you know, black men might find that they can express themselves through writing. Mm. Yeah. I mean, interestingly enough, I think artistically, when I was younger, I always had um, I always I thought I was going to be a rapper for a while. Um, and so, yeah. And so I was. What's the rap name? What's the rap name? Uh, I ended on uh, Osh. Osh. So short for instead of oh shit, just oh sh. <laughs> yep. Um, and so yeah, for a while I was I was I was I thought I was gonna be a rapper. Um, and what's interesting in terms of who my favorite rappers were, right? Like Biggie uh -huh. up. Um, you know, you can you can get blinded by the bravado and um, you know, looking back and being older, seeing the misogyny and patriarchy within the lyrics. Um, but also his first album, Ready to Die, is such a personal reflection of his journey as a black man growing up in Brooklyn. Um, you know, uh, it's not it's not it's not by mistake that Juicy is one of his greatest hits. You know, he starts with it was all a dream. Right. And, and, and talking about his mother smiling, seeing him in the magazine and actually making it. And do you know what I mean? Because we always yeah fire to this thing that actually society tells us that we shouldn't or can't have. Um, and so I think, yeah, to answer your question artistically, I, I definitely use the pen to be able to uh, express myself. Um, I, you know, I also did poetry and open mic nights and stuff. So that was definitely, yeah, that was definitely a journey that allowed me to open up um, in a way that I don't think I could in my personal relationships, at least at the time, especially as a younger man. Mm. Um, I'm curious, man, because it's interesting. I uh, going going back, right? And so, because it's been some years since we first first did this, mm -hmm. um, right. and, and so I'm wondering for you, when you got my piece, right? You were presented with my piece, and you read it. What was that journey for you in terms of getting into the play? Um, were there like any struggles? I'm wondering. You know, I'm curious. We never really got to to chop it up in terms of did you have any struggles? What was it like actually performing the piece? Like what? What what came up for you? Are you are you speaking about when we did it? What was that? Two thousand and fifteen? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. When you first thought, yeah, when you actually did the run, when you actually actually had to perform it. You know, I liken it to you know, um, it's like an alley hoop. Mm. You know, it's like Drew Holiday to to Giannis. I'm not gonna make it myself Giannis or anything like that. I mean, I will. Right I believe you. But you know, it's it, it's interesting because as a black actor um, 
and and I'm I, I wasn't classically trained coming up. You know, I, I went to school for business, and I started doing the school of hard knocks and taking classes everywhere before I even went over to England and studied. You know, at the, the British American Drama Academy and all of that stuff. Okay. But the majority of the things I'm handed are either old, old, old black works, like mm -hmm. hey, try this Dick Gregory piece, mm -hmm. which is amazing. I mean, I did get to connect to to my predecessors, you know what I'm saying? My people who, the giants upon who I stand on their shoulders, right? But it's rare that I get opportunities where somebody's writing specifically something that speaks to me. Mm -hmm. And it's foreign sometimes. And so when I got this piece and Jonathan McCrory handed it to me, he could have handed me one of the other six pieces at the time. There were six, right? Mm -hmm. Now there's seven. Right. 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 Kelly. Kelly. Yeah, correct. So for him to hand me that piece, Jonathan McCrory had seen a lot in me from some auditions and, and from doing some other work around New York. Mm -hmm. he, he saw something in me, saw something in you, and he saw this kindred spirit and was like, here try this piece. This is the one I want you to audition for. This is the one I want you, I see you in. And so of course I'm reading it and I'm, and I had an, an, an immediate buy-in. Mm. When you have an immediate buy-in as an artist, it's so freeing. Mm. And, and the confidence you have in which to uh, attack that piece is, is through the roof, mm. you know? So, so in terms of obstacles, the obstacle is interestingly enough, is letting go mm. emotionally because mm. some of the stuff is just so uh, uh, familiar. Yeah. Sometimes too familiar. Yeah. I, as a matter of fact, that's the word that's used in the piece, familiar. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you just want to play. You just want to, I'm going to act out another character. There's going to be pieces of me in this character, but no, this is actually something I've experienced. This is real. And so I will say, honestly, uh, talking to a couple of other actors, when we did it at, when we were doing it for a few performances, it was very heavy on us. Mm. It was very heavy. Uh, I really felt like I gave a piece of my soul each night. And mm. it was less about trying to get it right Mm -hmm. You know, most performances, I'm like trying to be pitch perfect on something or I'm trying to make sure I hit certain um, uh, moments and get to climaxes and things of that nature. You know, it was it wasn't about that. These mm -hmm. words were spiritual to me and it and it wasn't as cathartic as I thought it was going to be. It was so much for me that I couldn't like actually let out. Mm -hmm. so that, that was really tough for me because I was like, if I do go there, it, Will I be honoring the playwright's intent? Mm. And will I be able to control myself? Mm. Mm. Will the performance stop? So that was the hardest thing is to make sure that the words were honored because the words take me there. Mm. Mm. Yeah, man, you, um, I appreciate you sharing that. That's, uh, it's interesting. I, I, we talked before, I don't, the audience doesn't know this, but we talked on the phone before, before you got to record um, on the piece and we chopped it up. And you make me think about the, the, the moment where I, you know, I had a chance to perform my own piece. Um, I performed the piece myself. And what I found at the time was how I was actually leaning away from the fuck yous. Um, and I was, tr I found myself trying to make the audience feel safe. Um, and, you know, I liken it to my conditioning. The first time I really realized that I did that or I was doing that was not when I was performing on stage, but when I was, I used to work at Best Buy, right? And I worked in, um, I worked, uh, I sold TVs. I was in the, in the, in the department, you know, selling TVs and media. And I found myself uh, when I was speaking to my white customers um, and particularly white women, but white men as well. Um, I found myself talking in my higher voice. Um, I, I found myself making myself smaller um, and making sure that they felt safe. Mm. Yeah. And nobody taught me to do that. Um, and it was actually in that as, as I was working with different customers and then some black customers would come in and Asian brothers and sisters would come in and I see that I was shifting. I found myself shifting every different customer and I'm like, oh wow, you know, I'm, really, I'm really conditioned to make them feel safe yeah. so that I feel safe. Yeah. 
right? And for the performance where I'm saying, you know, fuck you to white supremacy, I need to be able to let go of that and be vulnerable. And um, and in ter- at least in my uh, the w- reason that I wrote the piece was to be able to explore our humanity in its fullness. Mm. Um, and specifically really in, in our journey, the journey of grief, right? And so there's the five stages in the Kubler-Ross model. Um, and anger is one of the stages of grief. Yeah. And, and so the idea that we can't feel angry or that we can't express our anger in times where it's clear <laughs> that anger should be a part of, mm-hmm. of, of the emotional journey um, cuts off our humanity and we then get caught in the cycle of dehumanizing ourselves by not allowing ourselves to be angry. Um, and rightly so, right? I mean, our anger you know, has gotten us killed. In, in, in plain sense, right? That that is a historical truth in, and not just our anger. Everything has gotten us. I, was say, I, I don't feel. I, I know what you're saying. I'm what I'm saying. So, so as, as a defense mechanism, what I'm saying is, as a defense mechanism, and you know, especially if you talk to somebody who believes in respectability politics, right? Not showing your anger is the thing that's going to keep you safe, right? It's the you same think. thing. We started talking about Trayvon Martin, right? Not wearing a hoodie is the thing that's getting us killed. Like, right. if you wear a hoodie, you're going to get pull up your pants. Like, it's it's what I look at in the in the play, right? Um, this dance that actually we shouldn't be dancing. This 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 jig that we shouldn't be dancing to at all. Um, we try to and navigating this very hostile waters that we've been navigating for 400 years. Um, we try to figure out how do we keep ourselves safe. Um, and the shutting down of our anger um, is one of those things, right? You don't want to be seen as the angry black man. You don't want to be seen as the angry black woman. Um, you know, that that is that is a stigma that we run away from. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. So that, you know, with the piece and you you performing it so so brilliantly um, and tapping into that, uh, you know, I, I wanted to whoever um, touched the work to be able to just let go and actually see what it feels like to explore that vulnerability. So, so interestingly enough, I mean, obviously there's, there's that, you know, desire of yours for, for the piece to be performed by a black man to allow himself that humanity and that vulnerability. It's in the words. Mm-hmm. It's also underneath the words and, and in all of the subtext, right? Mm-hmm. When you, when you, let me ask you this first. Yeah. <laughs> what is your desired audience? Like if you, I shouldn't say desire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you're like if you could pick out five hundred people to be in a room to see this performance, what would that look like? Oh, racially or or oh, or, Um, I mean, I, I I write for us at the end of the day, um, and when I say us, I mean um, I identify as a black man first. Yeah. Um, and then all the other identities after um, that is the way that I move in the world. That is the way that I've been conditioned. And so when I think about black people as a collective, um, that is always my audience. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I stand by the fact that specificity equals universality. And so the more specific I can be about my experience, others will be able to connect to at all times, right? Mm-hmm. And so I don't have to worry about who's in the audience. Um, I know who my directed audience is. I know who exactly, I know who I'm, I'm, I'm aiming to, to affect um, and think about and unpack um, this untreated trauma that we're all experiencing. Um, everyone else, um, if you are affected by, changed by, um, inspired by the work, um, that is a happy consequence. Um, but my my main goal is 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 us. Wow, I like that, yeah. You know, um, I so all right. So flash forward, right? So you you talked about the letting go and it not being a catharsis. Um, the years back performing it, um, when you got approached to perform it again and thinking about everything that has happened up until this point. Um, from the Trump presidency to uh, Floyd to the insurrection, um, so you get approached to do this piece. Where where were you at, and like what what were your feelings around performing it again? I, I, you know, it's so funny because uh, you know, just given 
I mean, in a multisyllabic word, calling it the insurrection. I don't even like that. Like, <laughs> like I'm, you know, because I feel like there's going to get romance at some point mm. in history books, especially in the state of Texas. You know, the great insurrection of mm. 2021, January 6th. You know what I mean? I know I'm just I I'm just, no, I'm I really, that. no, no, yeah. No. That bullshit that happened. That 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 unpatriotic bullshit that happened. Um, mm. but yeah, you know, we talked. Like you said, we talked because I called you and I was like feeling a certain way. I'm like, man, this is uh five years later, mm -hmm. and it it was on my mind that the piece was still relevant. Mm. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you. And we talked about that, and I, which I want you to share how you felt about it too. Uh, the fact that. Um, I don't want to say nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be reductive, but it's still a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's a major problem, right? Five years later, I'm like, how do I approach this work now after mm -hmm. everything that I've learned, how I've grown and all the other good stuff? And, 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 I, and as an actor, I'm always excited about how I've changed because I know it's going to change the work. Mm -hmm. You know, It's also scary in a way too. Um, because, you know, you want to hold on sometimes to like what the nostalgia of it was, you know, the youth of what I did five years ago. But I was like, you know, I'm a different person now and mm -hmm. I see the world differently. And so I was just really interested in it. Now, the, the only trepidation I had was, again, like, God, reliving this five years later mm -hmm. um, and going through the things that I'm asking myself and putting my body through to do it. Mm -hmm. But. Because the work is so necessary, that's just how I am. I'm like, I'm going to do it. I want I want people to listen to this. I want people to know that it's still a problem and that, like you said earlier, our humanity is still under attack mm -hmm. and we're not allowed to feel, feel human. Mm -hmm. Even five years since then, George Floyd and, and Ahmaud Arbery and all these you know different men who have been unjustly taken from us, it's like, this is still an important work. And so, um, yeah, I want, yeah, talk about like how you felt knowing that this piece was still going to be done five, five years later. Yeah. Um, I mean, similar to you, I mean, it's that it's a conflicting thing when I, when I got the email that they're doing the radio play and actually it's, it's been consistently done at colleges around the nation um, since the five, for the past five years. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, you get the residual check from um, Samuel French Concord Theatrics, right? And you're like, this is nice, um, but I wish it wasn't necessary. It's it's the one piece that I've written that I I, I, I hope at some point um, is irrelevant to where it's just like, yeah, it doesn't even make any sense to do this work anymore outside of looking at life retrospectively, you know, like, um, but it's so, you know, right now it's so relevant. It's like this pain that's like, I'm honored to be a part of this, this thing. Um, and, and, and to be a part of all the other playwrights, the names of the playwrights, the great playwrights that are a part of this piece and to have you and so many other um, black men and women, because there are some colleges that reached out to me and some institutions that reached out to me that asked if they can cast um, women in the piece. Um, and ask for my permission to allow that. And, you know, and I did. Uh, oh, you ain't David Mamet them, huh? You ain't yeah, David you know, they, 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 no, 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 I'm not gonna, no, I'm not gonna Mamet them. Cause I, I think, I think if it speaks to you, you know, as a, as someone who identifies as a black person, then please, you know, express that thing. So I, you know, I gave, I gave the okay. Um, but I, I really wish we were in a, I wish the hope is, and the reason that we even do this work is to get to a place where it's, it's not necessary. Uh, you know, um, I, I really, I really do pray for that on a, on a daily basis. Um, so yeah. Um, <sighs> so I, before we wrap this up, because I, I know we we have a certain amount of time, we got to yeah. stay in. Um, I was thinking about this conversation, and I was thinking about you specifically as a black man navigating America. And I remember when I came to, went to see it at NBT when it was in person. Um, uh, my my now wife um, Celestine going, oh, they found somebody. They found they found someone just like you. 
Like they, Jonathan found like you, right? Um, and and I say that because you are um, you are a black man of a certain stature and a yeah. certain size, and I I wonder about um, how you've navigated that up until this point. Yeah, I mean, you know, and you talk about being in the business world first before coming to theater. And, I, you know, I think about my journey and I think um, in talking about humanity and humanizing. Uh, let me just give you this preface. I, I was thinking about before having this conversation, I was thinking about how, um, you know, my father was a professional bodybuilder. Um, you know, I, I ran track. I did the martial arts. Um, I recognize the stereotype and caricature of the buck, the black buck. Yeah. Um, but there are also times where I leaned into it because mm -hmm. right for my ego mm -hmm. um, and 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 what I thought respect was supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and so I say that in terms of the way that we kind of play into the way society, you know, characterizes us. And I'm wondering what your journey with that has been. Um, <laughs> but you, 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 you gonna end on that? I don't. I'm, know. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, you know, because I think it's it's very it's a very specific thing for a brother of your stature to stand up there and be like "fuck you," right? As opposed to someone, and this is no disrespect to anyone who's like five two um, and 110 pounds, but it's a different experience, right? And yeah. we're very aware of because you've lived in this body and this lived experience. I'm I'm, I'm curious about what what that experience has been for you. Damn, Dennis. Wow. Damn. Uh, it, 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 I was like going in so many different ways when you were talking. I was like, how do I keep this germane to the play? And it, it automatically is because you, you set up where you went with this play was basically saying, I am human. Mm. And when you are human, you experience the whole gamut of emotions and worldviews and and self view and and you know one thing about me and, and a brother like you our size is we don't live our size every day you know what i'm saying i'm still a human being and like you said those stereotypes and those those uh assumptions about me aren't applicable mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. so when i'm doing the piece i'm not conscious of that right mm -hmm. but before and after i do the piece i am yeah, because I'm 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 now within the world in like W. E. B. Du Bois said I have that double consciousness. I know mm -hmm. I am a muscular black heterosexual man in this particular milieu as I'm walking around, and I and like you said, like you were talking about with Best Buy, I'm shape shifting and coding and switching mm -hmm. and doing all that type of stuff to survive. But doing the piece, I'm just me. Mm. whatever me is you know and and i think it's so interesting that you talked about how we lean in sometimes to that for our egos or mm -hmm. for our benefit but also that's just a part of being human like right now there's this celebration of of or this this encouragement of women especially black women but definitely women to celebrate their bodies and mm -hmm. to own their bodies because men historically to this day have tried to police them mm -hmm. And as black men, our bodies have always been policed. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like a, my relationship with with just white men, period. Like I've been in Vegas and just be walking down the street and drunk white men would challenge me. Uh -huh. Just because they like, oh, you, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, like want to get in a shoving contest or something. And it's like, where did that come from? Uh -huh. I'm with 20 other people, but you picked me out. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and there's this policing of it. But the this piece allows me to shed that mm. and not worry about my size and all those other things that matter. But I but I do at the same time recognize it's very important because, like you said, we don't get Hollywood or or a lot of playwrights allowing black men of our size and stature and, and some of our our sensibilities a chance to be human on mm. stage or film. Mm -hmm. And then you got last thing I'm gonna say is then you gotta be careful because then they'll start to exploit that. Like I have been asked sometimes, oh man, you know, can you can you do this this piece because we need to see a black man cry, like a black yeah. man your size. We want to see that, and I'm like, whoa, that's mm -hmm. not even an artistic. This like you now you just exploit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. 
You feel me? Then yeah. you gotta be careful, man. We, it's there's so much danger that lies in this body that we live in, you mm-hmm. know. So I don't mm-hmm. know if I answered that succinct. It definitely wasn't succinct, but you know, that's just no man. That's Thank a you. Good question. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, man. I appreciate I appreciate the man that you are. I appreciate the artist that you are. Um, and I really appreciate that you've been able to explore this piece um, multiple times um, and bring it to life um, in a way that I think honors it um, and and more importantly, honors you um, and, and your body. And so thank you, brother. I, I appreciate it for real. Well, I appreciate everything you said. The feeling is mutual. So much respect for you, your work, your words, as well as the way you think. Thank you for showing up today. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today um, and hope that you enjoy the piece. Um, I shouldn't say enjoy it. Uh, what would you say? What would you say, Dennis? I hope that they um, digest. I hope that you guys uh, digest the piece. And uh, thank you again, Dennis A. Allen the second, a.k.a. Oh, <laughs> Uh, God bless. Thank y'all. Appreciate y'all. Take care.